real quick before we get started, I just want to mention the project a little bit. I, I will have more details about the project, but I forgot that I had on here that meetings will start on week three, which is this week. Uh, meetings don't start this week. Uh, nothing, you don't have to do anything with the project until I announce something in class. I'm still finalizing the details of how I want the project to run this year. And one thing that I know I'm doing is pushing it to later in the semester so it's not such an early start. Uh, it didn't really work having such an early start because you didn't really know much about development at that time. So uh, it just didn't make sense. So don't worry about the project until I announce something in class. And then uh, uh, you know, if you want to form your teams early and start thinking about it, that's fine. I am allowing teams of five. So you can have teams of four or five members. So if that affects your team uh, forming decisions, uh, you can have four or five for this uh, project. All right. So we're almost at the end of the homework one content. At this point, we have one more lecture of content. Uh, after today, you'll have all five objectives. You'll be able to complete the entire homework. And then Wednesday and Friday, the rest of this week, are going to be examples. I'm going to show you examples, get into more specifics, get into some code, and show you how to apply some of these concepts. So if they don't make complete sense in the slides, that's where we're going to really hammer things down. But today is the last day of content, of technical uh, concepts, conceptual content for homework one. So let's take a look at homework one and just get the roadmap of where we're at. Last time we talked about Docker. So you know how to set up your Docker file, how to run Docker, and get your homework set up to run uh, where the TAs can just say Docker build, Docker run, and run your app. We saw how to do basic HTTP requests and responses. You set up your TCP socket server. And then when you get information over that, however you're reading it in your language, however you're setting up your TCP socket server, once you get your information in there, there will be examples of that on, uh, on Wednesday as well. Uh, once you get information over the TCP socket server, you interpret that as an HTTP request, and then formulate an HTTP response and send that back over the TCP socket. Uh, so that was Hello World was just setting up your TCP sockets and making sure that you can speak to a client. A client can connect to you, it can send HTTP requests, a very basic one, and you can send an HTTP response and making sure everything's structured properly. Then we did a few different response codes. The 404 is just like the 200, it's just like Hello World, but the 301, that's the one that causes a lot of issues. That's the one we get office hour questions and Piazza questions about. Uh, if the, biggest, the two biggest things with a 301, if you're struggling with the 301, if your browser's hanging, one, if you're testing in Firefox, make sure you have content length of zero. Uh, I demoed that one in class. But one that I didn't, uh, didn't mention as thoroughly, I did mention it in passing uh, very briefly, but your response has to end with a blank line. So when you're parsing requests, and when you're parsing, uh, when more specifically here, when the browser is parsing your responses, there has to be a blank line separating the headers and the body. So any parsing code is going to look for that blank line, which is going to be, you look for that slash r slash n slash r slash n. If you see that, two of those back to back, you know you have a blank line, and you know that's the end of the headers. So when we start parsing requests, post requests that have a body, we're looking for that blank line to make sure we know we've read all the headers. The browser is going to do the same thing. So even though your 301 has an empty body, there is still a body, but there's just nothing there. You still have to have that blank line, or else the browser is going to say, OK, I didn't see a blank line yet. Let me sit here and wait for more headers, because I think there are more headers, because we obviously haven't reached the body, because there's no blank line. So the browser is going to hang, waiting for you to send in more headers. And it's going to wait, and it's going to wait, and it's going to wait, until uh, you'll notice if you shut down your server, then it'll finally say, OK, I guess I'm not getting any more headers, because the TCP connection was severed. So I'm not getting any more headers. Let me just process this with what I have and then it'll redirect. So if you're seeing that, make sure you had that blank line at the end of your HTTP response. Make sure you had that blank line. Even if there's no body, you have to have that blank line, because that's how the parsers are written. Uh, that's, uh, and that's how, the, how HTTP is defined. HTTP says you better have that blank line, even if there's no body. Uh, so we can write parsers, or else we can't write parsers. Uh, when you get to parsing post requests, you wouldn't be able to do it without that blank line. We need something to say. I'm done with the headers. This is the start of the body. And that blank line is exactly how we do it. 
All right, in objectives three, four, and five, we're actually covering how to do all three of these today. It might sound like a lot, it's three out of five objectives, but it's a lot of the same concepts, it's a lot of the same, uh, same topics. We're just sending different types of information. If we can send back hello world as plain text, it's not too much different to send the rest of these three things. So let's see how to do that. and talk about types and stuff. And just a reminder, I'm watching the lecture channel on Discord. If you have questions, hit me up on there, or just the old-fashioned raise your hands. And hopefully Dan's clutch made it uh, all the way to campus. Hopefully that's uh, doing OK. You didn't burn it up too much, if Dan's made it. It's, it's David. <laughs> David? Love it. Oh, Don. I, I saw that as an A, sorry. Yeah. I got my cardio. Nice. All right, uh, let's talk about encodings. The internet is a bunch of wires. We saw that it's physical wires, which can only send two pieces of information, either a one or a zero. If it's a copper wire, this is high voltage, low voltage. If it's fiber, it's light, no light. Uh, but it's, or if it's Wi-Fi, it's, I shouldn't have done this because I know I'm not savvy on my Wi-Fi technology, but it's different waves uh, going either one or zero. So ones and zeros, that's the only thing we can communicate over the internet. That's it, ones and zeros. Everything is binary. And you might have heard this in uh, about machines before. They can only speak binary languages. Everything is ones and zeros. Uh, these days, we're fairly far removed from that in most aspects of programming. We have very high-level languages now that get us away from the ones and zeros until you take hardware classes and you're really getting down to the, the details of the processor. Uh, so we're a little removed from that these days. But when we're talking about the internet and communicating over the internet, we got to be aware of these ones and zeros because we're plugging into these uh, you know, raw signals that we're receiving. Some of this is interpreted for us with IP and TCP. We saw that there are headers where the ones and zeros are just in a very specific format. The first four ones and zeros that are, we read over the wire, that's going to be the HTTP version number of the IP packet. Uh, and then everything's just in order. And if the, uh, the machines and the routers are all speaking the same protocol, which hopefully they all are, then we're going to be able to communicate just by ordering the ones and zeros in the right way. So once we get the request, the IP headers are gone, the TCP headers are gone, the messages uh, is assembled, all the, you know, TCP does its thing with sequence numbers and all that. Everything's there, it sends read requests, things like that. And then we get the HTTP request, which is still just ones and zeros. So how do we work with these ones and zeros? How do we tell what they do? And the answer to that's going to be MIME types and encodings. So MIME type tells us what type the information is. Uh, so far, we've seen text slash plain. That's the only MIME type we've messed with so far. Uh, so let's expand that and talk about other MIME types. The content type header that we saw is going to be set to some value. Again, text, .plain, text slash plain is the one we saw so far. The content type is going to contain the MIME type. MIME, Multi-Purpose Internet Mail Extension, it was originally just for email, but when HTTP started becoming more popular, HTTP, the, uh, the HTTP inventors, developers, whatever, uh, decided, hey, this MIME type thing, it's pretty cool, we're gonna adopt that, we're gonna use that for HTTP requests as well. So every HTTP with content is going to specify its MIME type through the content type header. A MIME type has two parts, a type and a subtype, where type, the common ones that we'll see are text, pretty self-explanatory, image, actually I guess all these are text, image, video, and there are all kinds of other ones. Uh, sometimes you'll see application uh, for JSON messages and uh, whatever type the data is, you'll see different types, yes. For the type video, would that also include audio or would that be a separate? That, that would contain audio as well. So you'd see like video slash MP4, and MP4 will contain the video and the audio.
And we have a lot of subtypes, the ones that we'll see. Text slash plane, we've already seen. For your part, uh, objective three, three, right? Uh, serving the static site, you'll use all the next three, text slash HTML, text slash CSS, text slash JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript, the proper one is text slash JavaScript, but you will see application slash JavaScript uh, sometimes. It's very common, uh, but both of them will work. The browser will interpret both of them properly. Uh, to my knowledge, text slash JavaScript is the right one. If, I'm, if I was reading the docs wrong, you know, let me know. But text slash JavaScript, if you're a MIME type, if you want to use application slash JavaScript or application slash JSON, uh, instead of text slash JSON, things like that. Uh, be my guess, it's common out there. But text HTML, text CSS, text JavaScript, they are text files, and the subtype tells you what that text represents. This is a JavaScript file, interpret this as JavaScript. Make sure it's very clear to the browser how to interpret that. Uh, image, image slash, the image type, so for objective five, they're all JPEGs, so image slash JPEG, tell the browser what type of image this is, so the browser knows how to decode that image. The image is sent is a bunch of bytes, a bunch of ones and zeros. You say, this is an image, and it's following the JPEG, uh, the JPEG file format. Then the browser knows exactly how to interpret those ones and zeros. It says, I'm going to decode this using my JPEG library, my JPEG decoding library, and render that image according to that file format. Then video, MP4, video, AVI, uh, whatever uh, type of video files you have. Same thing, uh, but definitely uh, image JPEG, these three, and then the text plane, you've, we've already seen, you've already used that. Uh, you're definitely going to need for your homework. We can also have extra information in the MIME type. Very commonly, uh, specifying the char set. So if you have a text type, specifying the char set and saying which char set is used to encode this, can be the difference between the browser rendering your text properly and not. Uh, so especially when we get to UTF-8, so objective four, you wanna make sure that the browser knows that's UTF-8 encoded text. So if you wanna specify additional information, a semicolon to separate multiple values, and this is common throughout all headers. If you want multiple values in a single header, we separate them by semicolons. So content type, MIME type comes first, semicolon, any additional values as key value pairs separated by an equal sign. So if I want to specify this is UTF-8, char set equals UTF-8 with lowercase UTF, uh, and that will say, hey browser, this is text, interpret it as HTML, and this is UTF-8. Some browsers, oh, in my opinion, browsers should just default to UTF-8. Not all of them do, especially if you're on a Windows machine. Windows really likes uh, using its ISO, I forget what the numbers are, uh, but a different uh, a different character encoding that's not UTF-8, tell the browser, hey, this is UTF-8, don't use any other encoding because I encoded this using UTF-8, so make sure you use UTF-8 to decode. And we'll talk specifically about what UTF-8 is in a bit. But for, for this slide, multiple values, if you want additional information on your content type, separated by a semicolon, key value pairs separated by equal signs. The browser Browsers are really advanced these days. They're really sophisticated pieces of software, by the way. I'm sure you're aware of that. But uh, one thing that they do that's pretty sophisticated is that they'll figure out the MIME type for you. They'll do what's called MIME sniffing. So when you send the browser some information, you send an HTTP response, the browser is going to try to figure out the MIME type. Even if you specify content type, if you specify the wrong content type, the browser's gonna try to help you out and figure out the right MIME type and then interpret it as that type of information. This can be a really good thing, but it can also be a very dangerous thing. And, uh, and luckily, we have a way to turn this off. We say X content type options, no sniff, as one of our headers, uh, which you saw in my examples the previous few days, uh, pre previous few lectures. If we specify this no sniff on our X content type options header, then the browser won't sniff the MIME type. It won't try to figure out the MIME type. This is our way of saying, I set the MIME type right in the content type. Don't try to help out. You're not helping, you're just hurting. I got the right MIME type. 
back off. That, that's what this no step says. Yes? How does it typically, like, let's say you send in something, uh, an image of a JPEG, and it's not a JPEG. Like, how does the sniffing know it's not a JPEG? Like, would it just like, try to plug it into the JPEG uh, and see if you go wrong? Forgot to put this thing on. Uh, that would be a question for, for the developers on that side. I would assume that they read the bytes of the file and try to guess what, how it's encoded. Um, but that would be, that's part of my uh, processes are really sophisticated, which is my way of saying, I don't know how they work. <laughs> they're, they're really fancy. Uh, they're really cool. Um, but they will try to guess that, uh, I assume, by reading the bytes and just looking around and having a whole bunch of code to try to figure that out. But we can tell them not to. Uh, this is required for your objectives, making sure this no sniff is set. We don't want the browser sniffing out our MIME types. And this is common across the internet. If you just go to a random website and check out the responses, they should have the no sniff set. We don't want the browsers doing this in most cases. Or in some, well, you know what, let me just get to my next slide so I can explain why. So we don't want the browser doing this specifically when we're handling user submitted content. So here's our concern with MIME sniffing. Or with, uh, MIME sniffing. We have a site where users can upload images, which will be homework two. You'll support image uploads and then displaying those images to all of your users. You support image uploads, and then you're going to put those images in the content of your page. Some user gets smart and says, you know what? I'm not sending you an image. I'm sending you a JavaScript file with a whole bunch of attack code that's going to steal people's cookies and redirect them to my attack site, whatever they want to do. We set the MIME type to image slash PNG, send that image to all of our users who visit the page. The browser says, this ain't no image. This is JavaScript. It interprets it as JavaScript, runs it on everybody's machine, and all of a sudden that attack code just was running on all of your users' machines. Unless you have no sniff set. No sniff says, no, this is an image, this is a PNG, I know it's a PNG, and then when it says, oh, it looks like JavaScript to me, eh, but I'm not supposed to sniff, so I'm not running this JavaScript, I'm not running this attack code. Then we can prevent that attack just with this one header. So this header, I believe, my opinion, should be set on every response, just get in the habit of always saying, browser, I know what I'm doing, thanks for trying to help, but you're not helping. You're just opening up a security hole. So we don't like that. We don't like browsers doing that uh, with our sites. Because we're going to get the content type right. You're going to set the right content type on your content, right? You're always going to get the right MIME type. If you don't, uh, and you have this no sniff set, and you have the wrong content type, uh, you'll get a message in the browser's console that says, hey, uh, I couldn't render this. Looks like the MIME type's wrong, but I'm not supposed to change the correct the MIME type, blah, blah. Uh, you'll see that message, and then you'll be able to debug that in your dev environment. And then you don't have the wrong content type set in production. Because you're going to catch that, because your page isn't going to render. If you have the wrong content type on your CSS, and you have no stuff set, you're just not going to see your CSS in dev. So you're going to be able to get your content types right before release into production. So uh, if you have no sniff set. If you don't have no sniff set, you might not realize that you didn't have the right content type. Why do we even have that slide there? And then MIME type tells the, uh, tells the browser how to process the content. <clears throat> OK, let's talk about text. This is going to be a running theme throughout the semester. It's very important uh, how text is encoded. Everything's ones and zeros. A lot of the information, aside from images, most of the information we're sending for homework one is text, whether that text is representing HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, just plain old text, it's all text. So how do we encode text as ones and zeros? The internet can only send ones and zeros. We want to send the letter A. How do we do that uh, when the internet can't communicate A? Well, for that, we use character encodings. So one you've probably heard of, you've probably come across this at some point, I would, I would assume, uh, ASCII text. This is a way of representing our characters as seven bit values. So we take seven bits. With seven bits, we have 128 total characters that we can encode. 
And then whenever the browser, if we say, hey, this is ASCII encoded, the browser sees seven bits in a row, and it says, oh, this must be uh, the letter A, because it's going to look up that seven bits, represents the letter A. And we have charts telling us how to encode and decode. If we have uh, 89, for example, in binary, that's going to be a capital Y. We have the capital letters, the lowercase letters, numbers, the 10 digits, and a bunch of special characters. So this is how we're going to represent our values, then send them over the internet. We have a bunch of ones and zeros. If those ones and zeros represent 3672, uh, then that's going to be dollar sign capital H, for example. So we're going from bits to characters with a character encoding. So if I want to send the string hello, I take my ASCII chart, I need lowercase h. Lowercase h is 104 in decimal, 68 in hex. So I got hex, that's going to be 68. E is 65 in hex. L is 6C, 6C, and then 6F. Convert the hex into binary or jump right to the binary if uh, you want to skip a step. But 6, 6 in binary, 8 in binary, 6, 5, 6C, etc. All the way to the F at the end. So if we represent hello in ASCII and convert it to uh, in ASCII using binary, this is what we're sending over the internet. This sequence of ones and zeros, fire that over the wire and the fiber, that's what's going to be actually communicated. That's what's flying through the air when we have text going through our Wi-Fi. That's what's sent through the air if you're sending hello. Well, not that exactly. We'll see in a slide. <clears throat> the There's something I just had in my head. Hopefully it wasn't too important. Um, the headers, the status line, and the response line of HTTP requests and responses are ASCII only. You can only use ASCII characters in HTTP headers. Anything before that blank line in the body has to be ASCII. It's somewhat restrictive, but that it's the way HTTP states it. HTTP was, you know, was developed uh, before we had UTF-8, which we'll talk about in a second. So to make sure everything's working, make sure old browsers, old parsers don't completely break down, ASCII only in HTTP headers. This really helps once we start parsing our HTTP requests, knowing that the headers are all ASCII characters is going to be very helpful when we start getting image uploads, for example. The body is going to be encoded in something that's not UTF-8 or ASCII or anything, but everything in the headers you know is UTF-8, or sorry, uh, ASCII. So you parse the headers assuming it's ASCII, and then the headers are going to tell you what the body of the request is, because the body might be, you know, whatever. It's, it might not even be text in the case of an image. So you need to read the headers to figure out how to parse the body. So we have to agree on an encoding for the headers, and then encoding is ASCII. Uh, but there is a big problem with ASCII. It's very restrictive. We only have 128 total characters. Uh, uh, that's And that's uppercase and lowercase letters is most of it, which is, you know, it's OK for English. but. Any other language, any language that uses a different library, if you need accents or, or anything, or if you have a, a, a that's not the right term, a, a symbolic language, uh, you can't do anything with ASCII. It's just completely worthless outside of a very small portion of the world population. Uh, very useless. Uh, so we need something more. And with the internet, we communicate on a global scale. In English only encoding is pretty worthless. We are stuck with it for HTTP headers. About side of HTTP headers, we want to use more, we want something more flexible. We want something that can encode whatever we want to communicate in whatever language. So enter UTF-8. UTF-8 is going to save the day here by adding more bytes so we can encode 
more messages, more than 120. 120 is ridiculously restrictive. Uh, it was only good for the early days of English only uh, internet communication. So UTF-8 is going to add more bytes optionally to the messages, up to four bytes. And then we're going to use the bits of those bytes to determine how to encode and decode these characters. If the very first bit is a zero, the remaining seven bits are exactly ASCII. So it's very convenient that ASCII is seven bits and not eight. If it was eight bits, uh, this would be harder to do. We'd have to bulk up our encoding here if we want to have these features. But if the first bit is zero, interpret the next seven bits as an ASCII character. So in this way, UTF-8 is a superset of ASCII. So if you have ASCII text and you say encode this as UTF-8, you get exactly ASCII. You get 8-bit eight uh, eight characters, all with leading zeros, and it's all just ASCII. So you would have a few extra zeros in there, uh, depending on how you encode your ASCII anyway. Probably have those zeros anyway. Uh, but this is ASCII if the leading bit is a zero. If the leading bit is a one, it will have at least two ones, and the number of ones will specify the number of bytes being used. So if my value starts with two ones and then a zero, if it, the next one was a one, of course it would be three ones. Uh, one, one, zero, that means I have two bytes for this character, and each continuation byte will start with one zero. So if I start with four ones and a zero on the first byte, that means I'm going to have four total bytes. The three subsequent bytes will all start with one zero. And then all the x's are going to represent my actual character. That's what actual character we're representing with this encoding. So this is structured very specifically such that no character is a substring of another character. Even though we have variable number of bytes, there's no way to misinterpret this. We can't read this. Like any continuation byte happens to start with one zero, which the first byte of a character can never start with one zero. So if you have a one zero, you know you're still reading the previous character. Uh, it really cuts down the decoding errors. If a bit happened to be flipped when this is being sent over the internet, depending on what bit was flipped, if it's any of these leading bits, we're going to get a decoding error and be able to detect that error. If one of the X's was flipped, at most we're losing one character, and it's not messing up the rest of the encoding. So really fancy, really uh, quite future-proof. We have a lot of bytes to be able to represent a ridiculous number of characters. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. It's enough that every language, every uh, known character and emojis even are all encoded using this format. Oh, I do have a slide on that. So UTF is what we want to use when we're encoding text that we're sending. So our headers, ASCII only, but the body that we're responding with, and in Objective 4, this will be the case, the body that we're sending can contain UTF-8 characters. And honestly, these days, most browsers are going to respect the UTF-8 in the headers, but it's not part of the protocol. So we would be in violation of the protocol if we're sending uh, UTF-8 non-ASCII characters in the headers. But in the body, we say char set UTF-8, and then in the body of the response, we can have non-ASCII characters using UTF-8. We can send anything we want in the body. So when we're sending strings over the internet, we have a string that's language specific. A string doesn't exist over the internet. Uh, the internet doesn't know what a string is. String is language specific. It's not until it hits our code that we interpret bytes as a string and have this concept of a string or an array of characters. Uh, so when we're communicating over the internet, we take that string encode it using UTF-8, which converts the string into a bunch of ones and zeros, send that over the internet. And then on the other side, there's another program running that also knows of a string in its language, 
which might be very different than a string in whatever language you use. Maybe you're using Python and the other end is using JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript's going to interpret it as a JavaScript string by taking the UTF-8 characters, those ones and zeros, all those bytes, and saying, let me follow the UTF-8 standard and convert this into a string in my language. And then, I, then it can display it, you know, print it to the screen, uh, display it in the browser, show it to the humans uh, who want to see the actual characters that those ones and zeros represent. So over the internet, we're only speaking ones and zeros, but we use UTF-8 to be able to speak characters between two programs running on opposite ends of the internet. UTF-8 is helping us communicate like that. Any questions to this point? And in... Uh, I mentioned a few languages. The most popular ones in this class seem to be JavaScript and Python for one reason or another. Um, but in JavaScript, the decoding and encoding tends to happen for you automatically. When you send bytes back to the client, it's automatically encoded to UTF-8, which can cause problems later on. You've got to peel that back and not encode it all the time. So if you're sending an image, you have to not encode it. Uh, in Python, when you have that encode and decode, you probably saw in whatever TCP tutorial you were using, there's this dot encode and dot decode all over the place. That's your UTF-8 encoding and decoding. So when you receive message over the wire, over the TCP connection, one of the first things you do is hit it with a dot decode, which decodes the UTF-8 and converts it into a Python string. Python, by default, is going to use UTF-8. And then when you send that data back over the wire, back over that TCP connection, you're going to say encode, take this Python string, encode it as a UTF-8 byte sequence, and then send that over the wire back to, uh, back to whoever requested this information. The encode and decode are very important. That's where you're doing all this stuff. This is very important for objective four. The content length is the number of bytes not the length of the string. Content length is the number of bytes being sent in the body of the response or the request once we start parsing requests. The number of bytes. So if it's ASCII, if you have ASCII only text, every character is a single byte. And you can get away with string length as the content length. Because if it's all ASCII, every character is a single byte, and you're good. You got away with one there. But once you start sending non-ASCII strings, like for objective four, you're going to have certain characters that are represented with multiple bytes. So when you get the content length, when you're computing content length, you have to make sure you're reading the content length of the number of bytes, not the number of characters, or else you're not going to get all your information on the other side. If you're doing the string length, you're going to get decoding errors. You're going to get those boxes that, that's a UTF-8 decoding error. You're going to get some, uh, you're not going to get the content that you want rendered. So make sure the content length is in number of bytes, not number of characters. Number of characters will get you through all the objectives one through three, but once you hit four, where I specifically have you sending non ASCII text, you're not going to get away with that anymore. So get in the habit of reading the content length in bytes, not characters. Uh, so, so like for my Python examples, when you do the, you know, right now you're probably doing like uh, socket dot send all what I'm sending back dot encode. Uh, you got to break that up a bit. Encode it first. Get the length of the string after encoding. Set that as your content length and then send the encoded bytes over the wire. But you got to get the bytes, the number of bytes for that content. All right, any questions to this point? It's one of those lectures that's, I think it's pretty straightforward to watch, and then when you sit down to code it, that's when you get the questions. So unfortunately, I don't get many questions right now. But, um, but that's why I have two days of examples after this lecture. All right, so what about non-text data? 
Oh, we'll look for non-text data. Uh, so for objective five, you have to send an image. The biggest problem I have with students sending images, the biggest questions I get in office hours is overthinking it. Don't overthink your image, sending images. You're going to read the file, which you're already doing in objective three. You're already getting your file I.O. on in those, uh, those objectives. Read your HTML, read your CSS, read your JavaScript, and send it over the wire, uh, which I assume you can all do file I.O. by this point. You're in a 300 level CC class. Uh, with a file, you're going to read it, read the file, and then send it. It's already encoded in binary. It's already encoded in bytes. You're reading it as bytes. Just read it and send it. Done. Well, read it, dot length it to get the, the number of bytes, and ship it. Done. Sending images is pretty easy. Objective five, the, the challenge there is getting the pathing. Uh, there are multiple different images that you can send. Uh, I strongly, I'm not going to require it, but I strongly recommend that you build something dynamic to be able to get any request for images slash whatever, and then interpret that as a request for an image and dynamically read that file name and then get that image. Uh, though some of you will hard code, you know, there's a finite number of images that I'm asking you to host. You'll just have if, uh, yeah. ooh, I forgot what they were. If, uh, if flamingo, if elephant, thank you. If lion, uh, you know, send that. That's fine for homework one. That's fine. But uh, if you write something more dynamic, it's going to help you in the future. In homework two, you won't get away with that. You have to host images that are uploaded by users, so you can't. You can't hard code that. You can't do that. Um, so I recommend doing that now. It'll save you time on homework two. But you're going to do what you're going to do. Anyway, sending images. Read the file. Some languages, are, depending on how you're reading the file, it might want to read it as a string. Make sure you're not reading it as a string. Read it as bytes. Read it as a byte array or a buffer in Node if you're using Node. Uh, whatever your language has to just get raw bytes and read the bytes. That's what we want. We don't want to interpret this as anything. We don't even care what image type it is. What the actual image type is, it's going to be JPEGs for the homework. Uh, for specific reasons, I guess I don't have to. Oh, we got 10 minutes. Um, I use JPEGs here because they're less forgiving. With a PNG, if you miss some bytes, if you don't get the entire file sent in the right content length, the browser's still going to decode it, and you're just going to be missing part of the image, which probably won't even be perceptible when the TA is grading. You're just going to miss like one pixel in the bottom corner. A JPEG has to. Uh, the way it's encoded needs every byte of the image to be able to decode it. Uh, the bytes are the pixels are scrambled throughout this uh, f the fancy compression algorithm to compress the image, which scrambles all the bytes all over. So you need every byte of the file to be able to decode it, or else the picture doesn't render at all. Uh, so I use JPEGs to make sure that you're getting your bytes and your content length proper. If your content length's off by one, the image doesn't load. It's easy to tell that you did it wrong. Uh, PNG, we would never be able to tell if you did it wrong. Uh, I used PMGs the first time I ran this class, and I realized that was a mistake. The reason it's a big mistake is because when we get to later homeworks and you didn't learn how to do that right, you have huge problems instead of small problems on homework one. Uh, so send the image, and you get a request for image slash image name. Read the file that's requested, and ship it. Read it in binary. Never, ever, ever, this is something I will be saying throughout the semester, and I'll still have uh, last few weeks of the semester, still have students doing this. Never, ever, ever decode something that's not encoded as text, that's not UTF-8, ASCII, ISO, whatever. Never try to decode it as text. You will get errors. You will get broken servers. Nothing's going to work. If you read an image from a file, and try to decode that. If you have a dot decode in Python, for example, try to decode that using UTF-8, everything's going to break. Python will just crash. It'll say, this isn't UTF-8. I'm done. I'm out of here. Uh, and your program crashes. Never try to decode something as UTF-8 if it's not UTF-8. So if you've just been using that encode and decode in Python and uh, just taking that for granted and being like, oh, yeah, we always get information and uh, decode it. And when we send information, we en encode it. 
uh, that's not what we want to do with images because images are not UTF-8 encoded. The bytes will not follow the UTF-8 protocol. That chart that we have, your JPEG is not going to follow this. So you're going to get decoding errors. It's going to read the first byte. Maybe the first byte starts with one zero in the first byte of your image. Well, that's not proper UTF-8 and things break. And eventually you're going to have something in that image that doesn't follow this protocol. Probably pretty quick in the first couple of bytes, something's not going to follow this. The image would have to be some miracle image that just happens to be proper uh, UTF-8 encoding. It's not going to happen. Everything's going to break. So make sure you never Make sure you never, ever try to decode the bytes of an image or any multimedia as UTF-8. It's not going to work. And even in languages like Node, uh, JavaScript, will decode. It'll give you something. It'll kind of like gloss over the decoding errors and give you something, some string. But it's not going to be meaningful. It won't be meaningful information. And then when you go to encode that again, it's not going to go back to your original image. So if you take the image, decode it as UTF-8, and then re-encode it, you won't get back to the same bytes. Because of however your language handles decoding errors in UTF-8 isn't going to get you back to the original bytes. What you're going to get is a proper UTF-8 formatted string that represents something, something meaningless to us, but it will not be your original image, which was not formatted as a proper UTF-8 byte sequence. So never, ever, ever take your multimedia and try to decode it as UTF-8. It's not going to work. Things will break. Don't do it. Uh, but there is a problem with this. When you send your images over the internet, you have your headers. I shouldn't say a problem, but something you need to think about. You have your headers, which are ASCII encoded, that you have to send. Your status line and your headers, that's ASCII encoded. And then the body is going to be an image. So, and you send it all in one response. So you have an image and ASCII, which all has to be sent as one byte sequence. So what we have to do is take our ASCII, encode it to a byte sequence, take our image, which is already a byte sequence, concatenate those two sequences in the world of bytes, and then send it over the wire. Yeah. Nope. Because once you, because that's what you're going to be tempted to do is take your image, encode it, concatenate it using string concatenation, and then de uh, decode it. Yeah, decode it, and then concatenate using string concatenation, and then encode the entire big string and send it over the wire. You can't do that because your image just completely broke. Your image got obliterated because in that process you encoded the UTF-8 and then decoded back to UTF-8 bytes, which is not your original image. So you have to convert your string, your headers, your response line, that string that ends with a blank line, convert that to bytes and then concatenate the byte sequences. In the world of bytes, not the world of string characters, concatenate the byte arrays or byte sequences or buffers or whatever they are in your language of choice, and then send them. So the order is very important. Don't, uh, don't accidentally convert your images to UTF-8. Things will break. And getting your content, content length, we talked about it length, but. Uh, and then your MIME type is image PNG or image J, uh, JPEG for the homework. All right, any more questions? I'm out of slides. Traffic here is perpetually bad. Anything? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then concatenate the, the bytes. Yeah, and then send it. Yep. But you don't have to. You know, I mean, you don't have to encode your headers. You can't right? Just the body. You can 
the headers have to be UTF-8 because the internet doesn't understand strings. So we have to convert that to bytes, which you're already doing like for slash hello for objective one, you're already converting it to bytes and then sending it. You have to do the same thing here, but you got to get the image in there too. All right, save our own Wednesday. <laughs>